Welcome to the Integrated Schools Podcast. I'm Andrew, a white dad from Denver. And I'm Courtney, a white mom from Los Angeles. Episode 12, Whiteness versus Rightness, a conversation on colonizing. <gasps> We're talking today about how we show up in integrated or integrating spaces. You know, we've we've talked about the importance of showing up, but today we're really just going to focus on on the how, yeah. like the the ways that we show up and the ways that you know, regardless of our intentions, our impact can sometimes be negative. You know, here here at integrated schools, we often use the shorthand of colonizing as a way to refer to the the problematic ways in which whiteness has a tendency to get centered in diverse or global majority spaces. Yeah. And we've talked about this in many episodes. Gosh, maybe every single episode. It, do, it does seem <laughs> to come up a lot. I mean, I think in some ways, most of us know that colonizing is bad, but I think we need to be clear about what the effects of this are. So before we jump into this talk, Andrew, can we go through what colonizing causes? Yeah, for sure. And I, I think if you are listening and you have not checked out the video on our homepage, integratedschools.org, it's really great. It gives sort of an overview of a lot of this. But, you know, sort of fundamentally colonizing is about centering whiteness in a school, uh, you know, a takeover of white and or privileged sensibilities in a school. And that and, and that's not integration, right? It's possibly right. desegregation, but very often it's only temporary also. Yeah, right, right. So, you know, we increase the cultural whiteness in a school, and that is often a precursor to demographic shifts towards more whiteness or more privilege in that school. So, yeah. we, you know, white people like to go where white people feel comfortable, and a school that has been, like, vetted by whiteness is more <laughs> likely to attract more white people, right? right? And so if those people are just coming for the whiteness, then we haven't really integrated a school. We potentially de- desegregated the school, but but that's often, you know, either just like a temporary stop on the way towards a school flipping all the way white or all the way privileged and pushing out the current population, yeah. or it leads to like internal school segregation. So white or privileged kids are only in certain classes or certain tracks. That's right. And I think there's a third sort of effect of colonizing and, and one we don't talk about enough, and that's the toxic wake. Yes, the toxic wake. What's the toxic wake, Courtney? <laughs> yeah, so the toxic wake is what happens when when white families have somehow all come to a particular school. Maybe the school was sold as a hidden gem or a school that the families, you know, had hoped to fix. To fix in quotes, right? <laughs> yeah, fix in quotes, right. right. And and they found out that things were aren't quite working as they had hoped. So, you know, the principal right. isn't playing ball, right? Or there's a resistance to their colonizing efforts or the school is somehow not living up to their expectations. And so the toxic wake happens when the white and or privileged families get upset and leave mm. because they rarely leave without riling up others at the school. They rarely leave without loudly voicing their opposition to whatever is going on with their friends, in the playground, on social media, right? They leave loudly and they often leave en masse, not just one person at a time, but groups of families leave at once. Right, right. The playground reputation of the school gets even worse than if than if the white people hadn't showed up in the first place, right? Yeah. There's there's a difference between a school that, quote, no one goes to and the school that like, I, yeah, I went to and I tried it and it was a disaster. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. And sometimes even the leaving en masse-ness is so large that teachers have to be let go and classrooms have to be reconfigured, right? Yeah. Like this damage can be super real and communities have a lot of cleanup to do after the exodus. Yeah. And I mean, to be clear, you know, we are talking about the parents who have the capacity, who have the bandwidth or even the desire to get involved, right? Like there's plenty yeah. of space for parents who don't have that bandwidth or who don't have that desire to get involved. As we talked about last week, your choice has an impact regardless. If you do show up and you do want to get involved, it's important to think about how you go about doing that. Yeah, agreed. So let's jump in with Kelly. Um, she is a mom whose kids attend an integrating elementary school in Brooklyn, and she's been part of an intentionally integrating school since the school started and has thought a lot about integration and educational justice and race and white supremacy, etc. And we are really grateful to have her here sharing what she has learned. Yeah, she's great. Let's hear the episode. Kelly, would you like to introduce yourself? I'm Kelly. I'm a white parent to two kids in a racially and socioeconomically integrated school in Brooklyn. And your kids are in elementary school? Yes, I have a fifth grader and a second grader. And so we're going to talk today a little bit about the importance of how you show up, not just showing up. 
because while the goal is integration, there's a difference between desegregation and integration, right. right? Desegregation is getting people into the building, but integration is more about how you show up. So we want to just take some time and talk about the ways that people sometimes show up problematically and sort of what that leads to and where the sort of cause of that might be. As with many of these things, I think we've talked about a lot, there's a, a fine line to walk. It is good to show up and become part of a school community. Good intentions can sometimes lead us astray. Right. And, you know, and I, I think back to like all of the thousands of mistakes that I made when my kids were in elementary school and probably the mistake I made yesterday when my kids are in middle and high school. But it's like there's so much that we don't even know to examine. You want to behave well and you want to be a proponent for equity and justice, but you're not, it's hard to see all of the places in which you step on those beliefs on your own. Like you don't know how to Google how to be the perfect white person. And I think Kelly, you and I've talked about just the idea that there could be a manual for that is itself hilarious, (laughs) pretty problematic, impossible. But it is possible to do better, right? It is absolutely possible to do better. It's possible to keep trying and to seek to minimize your impact as you keep trying, I think. And mistakes are made and keep being made and asking for forgiveness is powerful and self-reflection is powerful and humility is powerful and persistence is powerful and experimentation, honestly, with a spirit of wanting to learn and believing that you are there to learn. Yeah. Is that the sort of root of it? Do you think? I feel like it's easy to focus your energy on some sort of superficial level things. I think we'll talk about that in a bit here. But if you, if you're going to focus your energy on something, is it humility? Is it curiosity? Is it willingness to learn? Like, is it relationships? What's the root thing to focus on? Do you think, Kelly? I think there are a couple components of the root. I think seeking to form relationships is huge. I mean, thinking about why you're there in the first place. So why are your kids there to learn? Why are you there? Maybe to learn too. Why are your kids there? To make friends? Why are you there? Mm -hmm. Maybe to make friends. You know, expanding that concept of the the point of a school and the existence of a school and the reason for education and being willing to see it as a chance for yourself to be educated. I thought the point of a school was to um, make sure your kids get good at taking standardized tests. (laughs) I I guess. That's not it. I didn't get that memo. I don't know. No, I mean, this is the thing, right? The wrong end of the telescope that our culture is looking through. But wow, is it an opportunity to change the way you perceive the structure, your participation in it, and see the point of everything. Honestly, that's been my personal experience anyway. We've talked a little bit about colonizing, right? The idea of white people showing up and taking over or trying to make a school look the way they think it should look or viewing the school as sort of a source of of untapped resources that they can then exploit and that can manifest in a number of different ways. Where does that often show up? That's a big question. (laughs) I mean, it's a huge, yeah. So so not, not in the context of the whole global society. From a school standpoint, this colonizing mindset, how does it often show up? I mean, to me, the uh, phrase that keeps coming to mind is white supremacy. That's right. And until or unless, as a white person, you are able to use the phrase white supremacy in casual conversation, I think you are still kind of peeking over the fence Mm. at this world we want to create. You know, I now understand white supremacy as another word for America, for the dominant culture. And I have a role in that, whether I like it or not. White supremacy is the belief that white ways of being are superior to other ways of being. And that the current dominant culture, which I would argue, and many people would agree, is an intersection of patriarchy and white supremacy. But that is the ideal to which everyone should aspire. That is the dominant culture. So the belief that the culture that's dominant is also superior, I guess, is the way that I would phrase white supremacy. Yeah. And and I think bringing it back to schools, like the way that shows up is a very narrow definition of what a good school looks like or should be. Kelly, in the lead up to this, I know you were pointing us towards the work of Tima Okun. Could you give us an overview, the sort of characteristics of white supremacy culture? sense of urgency, uh, perfectionism, 
defensiveness, quantity over quality, worship of the written word, paternalism, either or thinking, power hoarding, fear of open conflict, individualism in lieu of community or collectivism, progress is bigger, more right to comfort. I mean, there's all these pieces to it, right? Right. And they're real and they hold up. And so I would say that what you have to be very mindful of as a white person in diverse settings is that you bring those things with you. You are imprinted with them, whether you want it or not. We could go through a list and come up with lots of concrete ways that those show up, you know, communicating via one medium rather than another, moving faster rather than moving together. I mean, I think that for me anyway, we have to talk about white supremacy and we have to talk about the components therein. Right. Yeah. I think there's sort of, there's two levels, you know, one is the process. How do you get where you're going? And I think there's a lot of ways that white supremacy shows up in that. And then I think the the other piece of it is where are you going in the first place? And I think that the sort of colonizing mindset comes in and says, here's here's where we should go. If you want to come with me while I get us there, then that's great. And if not, like I will do it without you. Right. And so I think there's, you know, there's both the off-putting aspect of if you don't want to do it my way, then you're not really welcome to participate. But also the initial, here's what we need the school to look like. Here's the, you know, the resources that we need. And there's, you know, again, there's a, there's a line to walk because, you know, a lot of schools need additional resources. And because we live in a white supremacy culture, a lot of white people have better access to the connections to call to try to make things happen. So we don't want to get rid of that entirely, but the initial sort of, here's what what we want from the school has to be done in a collective way rather than a, you know, starting out from a valuing whiteness first mindset, I think. I think even just this idea of that we need to go anywhere other than where we are is in of itself perhaps a white supremacist notion or just failing to be truly present with the reality of the school community that you've joined. Why do we assume that Things need improving. Well, okay, public schools are woefully underfunded, right? So sure, almost all of them need something. But to your point, Andrew, the question of what they need definitely needs to be arrived at collectively. But if you're joining a community, one hopes that you like it and that you just want to be a part of what's there and certainly want to understand what's there before you go about trying to radically reinvent anything. I mean, my own personal experience is a little different because the school my kids attend was brand new the year my child started. So I wasn't entering an existing school community. That said, the lessons of just collectively building and seeing who's at the table and building the biggest possible table you can, it is very much a Hippocratic oath kind of thing. First, do no harm. Right. Because there's enough harm done to people of color in America without anybody adding to that. I mean, it's very delicate territory, but first do no harm. And that question of the things that you could do and the ways in which you might be inadvertently doing harm, that's a conversation that we all need to have. And it's a tough one and a tricky one. It's incredibly painful to think that you could be hurting someone unintentionally. I just wanted to list out some of the things that we've heard white and privileged families say that smack to us of white supremacy, that that sit as, you know, unintentional, inadvertent colonizing, Mm. that we thought that they are things that are right, not things that are white. I think what I'm thinking about is the need for organic food and the campaign that new parents are going to wage against breakfast in the classroom, the desire to build an organic garden, the push for homework in a specific way, right? Like we've mostly seen it as like aging campaigns to either eliminate or drastically reduce homework. Okay. You know, what are some of the, what are the other ones that y'all have heard? I think homework is always a flashpoint, how much and when, um, and getting rid of worksheets, the kind and quality of food that gets served or brought in for parties, the yeah behavior and uh, reward and or incentive systems. Yep. That has been one intrinsic versus extrinsic reward Mm -hmm. systems for behavior Mm -hmm. is something that to me seems freighted with cultural value. Yeah. Uh, Recess and time outdoors. Yeah. I mean, so I I guess the the things that I hear are, are things like 
rather than choosing to not go to that school, like, why don't you just go there and fix it? Yeah. Mm. You know, uh, if, if that school doesn't have enough of what it needs, like if you just go there, then maybe you can give it what it needs. Right. And, you know, I, there's good intent behind that. I mean, our school didn't have a laminating machine mm-hmm. until PTA fundraised enough money to get a laminating machine. And, you know, if it wasn't for a sort of influx of whiter and wealthier parents into the school community, I don't know that the school would have a laminator. So that's amazing. So how did you decide that the money should go toward a laminator and not something else? Yeah. So, I mean, that that is about the relationships. And so the teachers all said, like, we're printing stuff out over and over again because we can't laminate it. Teachers are going out and buying at home laminating stuff with their own money. It would be really great to have a laminator. And then we talked about it at PTA and we happen to be fortunate enough to have a PTA that is pretty diverse and representative of the school. And then we decided to do it. So that seems to me beautiful and an example of solving a real problem. Yeah. And that is what people of any stripe who are in an, an authentic dialogue with one another can do by identifying the actual needs and and not imposing their own personal needs and values on something that is way bigger than themselves. That the the relationships in that community enabled the real need to rise to the fore. There's only so much money, Andrew. I'm assuming you guys aren't rolling in the dough. At that point, it was it was most of the PTA budget right. that was spent on that. Yeah. So you chose to buy something that was in alignment with your values. Rather than that money could have gone someplace else. So it it seems like an easy thing, but it's actually a a beneficial process supporting a good outcome. That's, That's how I see it. It's a constant struggle to make sure that the voices that we are listening to are not the loudest, but are the most representative. Yes. I think so. A big part, if if we're bringing this back to how we can show up better, those of us who are aware of the imbalance of volume of voices, take our voices out of the conversation or amplify others instead. If you have not examined what you personally are advocating for, you need to do that post haste. Like that's the first thing to do. Why are you advocating for the things you're advocating for? And that's kind of what I would get into. Like, what do they represent for you? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the it's the underlying, you know, culture of white supremacy that says this is what's good. And if this is what's good, then I know and I happen to know what's good. Then, like, the sooner I can get us to good, Mm -hmm. the better for everybody, because what I'm trying to do is not just about my kid, but is about everybody, because everybody does better when we don't have homework or everybody does better when we don't have sugary breakfast. The sort of I know what's best because my lens on what is good is the right one. Or my, or my lens is the only one, right? I, I just can't. One, yeah. I, for me, no other lenses exist. I, I would take take it one step farther. Right, because it's not inherently dismissive of other views. It is just ignorant of them. Yeah, they're glasses that you're wearing that you don't even realize are on your face. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think it's a very strange day when uh, Courtney shows up in defense of poorly behaved white people. <laughs> So I'm feeling really weird. I'm usually the one who calls out more than calling in. And that's something I'm working on. But, you know, like this is the air we've been breathing about our broken schools and specifically about broken inner city black and brown schools. Right. How terrible yes. all of this stuff is. And I'm trying to live my values and sending my kid. But damn it, if it's not all broken, because That's, you know, like that's really the story that we've been told over and over again in a thousand different ways. I I think that the trick is figuring out how to ask yourself those questions when you don't even know that those questions exist. You're observing it through the glasses you're wearing, right? Like, like you have your own filter through which like all of the things that you observe don't just like come into your head as truth. They percolate through your history of being in the world. That is very true. So we're asking people to be aware of that first and foremost. Yeah, be aware that you're not aware is hard. This kind of makes me think of the nacho cheese, strawberry milk thing. So the idea of sort of strawberry milk or nacho cheese is the like, I'm showing up and, and looking at the food that is being served or being offered to my kids and saying like, this is a problem that needs to be addressed. We should not be serving strawberry milk to our kids, or we should not be giving them nacho cheese, or we should not be giving them sweet breakfast treats. So, you know, one one part of it is like, is that actually a problem? And, I, you know, I think it's hard to argue that we don't need to address the dietary 
practices of the country, but then also a sort of like prioritization. Is this a thing that is worth addressing right now? And so I think you see the sort of white supremacist mindset coming into schools. Often that sort of shows itself as I'm going to change what these kids are eating. So as a metaphor for many things colonizing, the issues around strawberry milk and nacho cheese are really powerful. And I think they're kind of a good, helpful exercise in thinking about how colonizing works and how we might begin to avoid it. So the issues around strawberry milk and nacho cheese speak to like rightness, right? Like, and whose rightness and what are the priorities? And I think, as you said in an email, Kelly, you know, strawberry milk interrogating nacho cheese is itself a pretty revolutionary act. Yeah. Interrogating strawberry milk will tell you a lot about what is going on. Why are you elevating the eradication of strawberry milk from your child's day above all other concerns? Not to say that the people are, but just these things become these magnets for change energy and figuring out what your focus on that is obscuring. It's, I think, a worthwhile road to go down. I remember talking with one parent who, you know, is new to her school and was charged with getting snacks for some after school event. And someone had mentioned to get nacho cheese. And she's like, but I really want to put some bananas or apples into the bag. And and like her first job was to go to the store and get a gallon can of cheese product (laughs) <laughs> and like step into the door and say, heat this crap up and serve it with some chips. Everything against <laughs> what she had been taught was being a good parent. I just get turned around on this really quick. I mean, if someone asked for nacho cheese, yes, go buy the nacho cheese, right? Don't replace it surreptitiously with something else. Low, low fat nacho cheese. <laughs> Do what is asked of you. But The question of whether apples and nacho cheese can and should coexist, yes, that's a real, that they should, of course, you know? Why do you feel that nacho cheese has to go away? Less than why do you feel that apples should be there? Can we have strawberry milk and regular milk? And, you know, the energy, and I really do think, more importantly, the energy that you would spend on gnashing your teeth about getting something instead of nacho cheese or about lobbying to get rid of the strawberry milk, put it somewhere else. If you have energy to put into the system, put it someplace where it's really needed. And when we say really needed, I think we mean serving the broadest number of people, right? I mean, isn't that, I don't know. I just think that that's why we participate in public schools. One hopes, unless we're back to resource hoarding, which is making sure that I use the system in the way that nets the best possible outcome for my child, I'd like to think we're getting beyond that. But then this belief that what's best for my child is best for all children, that's what we're really talking about, I guess. But is, is health and happiness and academic excellence good for all children? Yeah. Are there many routes to get there? Yeah. I, I, maybe it comes back to, to building relationships, right? Because there is a way to add carrots to, to the nacho cheese order that is not condescending and that is not white supremacist e. But it but it requires relationship building and it requires trust and it requires becoming part of a community and, and building that trust. Yeah. Part of building that trust is showing up for a while just with a can of nacho cheese. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And and showing showing up. Showing up quietly, showing up watching first, showing up listening. But again, if you're if you're showing up with those glasses on and those earmuffs on or whatever, so some work outside the space, some self-reflective work outside the space, coupled with some relationship building inside the space, maybe is part of the solution. You know, I don't, I don't think that the outcome of having apples in addition to nacho cheese is inherently bad. But the idea of replacing the nachos with carrots on your first job is not a good way to build relationships. Yes. And thank you for bringing it back to that. Uh, Cause I think that that, that is the core for me is what, yeah. What are your relationships in the community and what do you learn and, and what's the structure of those relationships, right? It's not just, Oh, I know them. And we, we know each other's names. It's like, are we friends? Do we have share a voice? I mean that, that in our school community, we're still working on that honestly. And we will be probably for a really long time. And how old is your oldest kid? I want to know how long a long time feels to you. Oh, it's been seven years. Okay. That's a long time, right? Legitimately a long time. 
<laughs> but well, I mean, not only is that legitimately a long time, but that's building from scratch, right? There, you didn't have within the structure of the school systems in place that needed to be unwound, right? right. Like building from scratch, you are right. still fighting. I mean, I think this is where. It's much more useful to put your time and energy and work because I think the the work is harder, but the payoff is bigger is like these systems you will you will have. And even if you built the perfect system within your school walls, your school walls are still within our country, which is still in a white supremacist context. Right. So you you will constantly have to push back against that, even if everything else, you know, is sort of falls into place in exactly the right way. It's an ongoing struggle. And I don't I don't I don't see that work going away until our society is fundamentally reordered. No, but the beautiful thing is that reordering these pockets can ultimately help reorder the larger culture because this is where we're building leaders and growing our leaders of the future, right? That's why it's yep. so important that we innovate and do things differently. But yes, to your point, starting from scratch, seven years in, we still have vastly unequal representation in, in all the important ways. That's what we're up against. But at least we're aware of it. At least we're talking about it. It's a stated value. And there's been a lot of growth for everyone, I think, involved. And, and trust. Trust has been built. And that is the important, important thing. And yeah, to your point, Courtney, showing up with the nacho cheese is a great way to get things off on the right foot, or at least not on the wrong one. I mean, being aware of what you represent as you walk around in the world is, it is heavy. Yeah. I don't, do you guys, have you guys had that experience? Yeah, for sure. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, it's uncomfortable and it's, I think it goes against our white entitlement that we feel like we should be comfortable or we feel like because I am not as actively racist as somebody else, I should be patted on the back or something for it. Mm. That, like I deserve credit for the things that I'm doing right rather than having to shoulder the blame of the things that I'm doing wrong. Hmm. It's not an accommodation that we make in our culture generally for people of color. Right. We are, we are used to asking people of color to represent right. all people of color. But then when, when we get looped in with the bad white people, we're like, no, 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 not me. Right. Give me some credit here. Like you have to believe me. You have to, you know, give me the benefit of the doubt and we don't get it. We don't deserve it. <laughs> we don't deserve it. And that's where the work is, I think is, is in earning it, is in proving yourself to be a thoughtful and humble and considerate ally. I think that a lot of the white fragility reactions that we see to the truth about white supremacy are instinctual recoiling from the psychological pain of the truth. Mm. If you look hard enough at the truth, it is so terrifying and painful that you want to run in the other direction. Right. And it calls everything into question, right? Like it's super destabilizing. If I actually believe that these racist structures are in place and that it is, it is as everywhere as people claim, then that, I think that mm-hmm. undermines like everything that I've s- stood on, right? Like, wait, this isn't a meritocracy. I worked my ass off to get couch and life and house and degree and blah, blah, blah. Like everything be- starts crumbling underneath your own feet. It's Alice in Wonderland. I mean, it's falling down the rabbit hole and not knowing where the bottom is. And indeed, the bottom doesn't exist. But I I really do believe that naming the negative emotions that come up, the fear, the sadness, the shame, the grief, I think it's a grieving process, quite honestly, that I've been on. And I don't think we talk about that a lot. And I'm not saying I want someone to hand me a box of tissues, but I'm saying that until I go through about 97 boxes of tissues, I'm not going to be the person that I can be, I'm going to be held back. And think about individual things with individual people, you know, healing from a death or a divorce or an accident or something terrible that happens, right? You got to feel it to heal it and move through it. Yeah. And that's why I think that integrated schools as a, as a network can help people look at that and sit with it and, you know, do it in ways where you're not heaping more shame and pain on other people, but you really are looking at the shameful truth and reflecting and, you know, kind of taking out your own garbage (laughs) as much as you can so that when you come back to an integrated space, you're able to throw off those glasses. I don't know. I really think that talking about how it feels and how it feels to deal with the truth of of race in America. And that's why I started with white supremacy, right? That's a phrase that a lot of folks would have had a really hard time saying three years ago or even understanding the way we do. I think, I think we've made progress.
You know, one of the things I hear a lot from parents, you know, uh, nacho cheese is really bad. And, and you're saying that integration is, is important and it's about access to resources and opportunities and separate is not equal. So it, it isn't part of this work showing up and, and not concentrating privilege and spreading access to resources. So how do I know when this is a nacho cheese situation or when this is a laminator situation? <laughs> Relationships. Ask someone to be honest with you and be willing to hear the answer. And, and you know, and that goes also back, Kelly, to what you were saying about this taking a long time. Yeah. Or, you know, when you're saying like, ask whether this is a laminator or a nacho cheese situation, sometimes it's really hard to build those relationships to ask. There's, I think, a lot of room for patience. And this goes back to what, what we were talking about earlier Absolutely. in terms of, you know, this this sense of dire urgency. But, you know, as parents, and it's like our kids are not getting or they're getting too much homework. They're, they're being crushed right now. We have to deal with the behavior charts right now because they're being shamed. And I can't wait. So I don't have someone to ask. Like, this all feels like pressures coming from different places. So we're saying, wait, mm. and they're saying, oh my God, my kid's crying because they got on, you know, the red sad face today. Mm -hmm. Like, I think it's just hard. It is. And you're, pa I mean, patience, you just have to keep showing up while, while trying to minimize impact while doing it, but you can't stop. You just, you know, it's, it, I, I've said about my experience with our school community is that it's as easy as showing up and as hard as staying put. Mm. Yeah. And another way we've put it, you know, and, and our wonderful principal and I talk in front of audiences sometimes and she'll say, you know, you aren't going to show up at our school community and not get pushed out of your comfort zone. And then I'll say, and sometimes we push you right out the door. <laughs> and that for many years was the reality of our school. This felt different and alien to everyone. And again, we were starting from scratch, right? We were starting at a place that nominally ostensibly was trying to bring equal share of voice to all comers, right? An intentional process. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us are stepping into places that aren't intentional about integration, justice, or equity. Right. And even in, in a place that started within some, with some intentionality, at least about diversity, and over the years has become increasingly intentional about education, justice, and equity. It has been a struggle to have equal share of voice and the white, you know, I always, I liken whiteness to water. I feel like it finds its level. It seeps into all the cracks and it's just a thing <laughs> that just permeates, you know, and, and that is even true in our, in our community, but awareness is the first step and the patience. I mean, and to, if you want anecdotes, I mean, yeah, we, I've had a family over for a play date and learned afterward since when we finally became close enough for the mom to tell me this, that she had called our school social worker first to ask whether she thought it was okay for her to come into my home. And I guess that's just because I seemed so alien. <laughs> I don't right. know. And we, la we laugh about it now. But the discomfort is so real. I mean, that's the other thing. Very simply, relationships, right? What's the foundation of building a relationship? Empathy, right? Mm -hmm. Putting yourself in someone else's shoes. If you can do everything you can to not only strip off your invisible glasses, but actually put yourself inside the frame, inside the body and mind and soul and experience of the person that you're trying to build a relationship with, it'll go a really long way. Our kids have a distinct advantage over us in this, in that they don't have all the years of programming. They live in the same culture, right? But yeah. they don't have all the years of programming. But as adults, it's incredibly difficult. And I screw up all the time. You know, there are certain cheats and shortcuts, I think, to building trust and relationships. And I would say they're ones that involve no talking. <laughs> so, like, dancing, sports, music, you know? Yeah. Community, doing things in community where we're all moving our bodies together that has been incredibly powerful for us as a school community, seeking joy and, and having um, a cultural or, you know, out of body kind of experience together. I don't know if you guys had any experience with stuff like that. Our school does like a, a fall festival and a spring festival. And both of them actually usually end up with sort of a dance party at the end mm -hmm. of the, 
we have a wide range of dancing abilities, I would say. <laughs> um, and yet everybody is there dancing, you know, participating. And, and yeah, th- those moments are really powerful for building community. I mean, I, there's two sides. You know, one is sort of uh, if you show up in a school that has some structures in place that you just need to, you know, become a part of a school that is designed around inclusivity, a school that with a community that is already present and valuing equity, valuing parent voice, valuing representation, those sort of things. That's like one set of challenges is how do you show up and become part of that and help facilitate that without taking it over? You know, I think the other side of it is there are a lot of schools that don't have that Mm -hmm. and that don't have a structures in place for for any sort of meaningful parental involvement. Yeah, especially schools like where you, you know, you're dropping off your kid, like they're jumping out of your car in the morning and then you're picking them up at a valet line or after the after school, like right at the tail end of after school. So you're not really even bumping into people. And there's no school meetings, right? Like the school doesn't have those things. Okay, but so in those communities, what are people advocating for? Why aren't they advocating to have those things as the first step? Well, so you as the white person walks in and says, this is what I think we need. I think we need school meeting. How, how is that not a belief about what is good and right and holy? Well, I'm not saying it's school meeting, but if we're saying it's about relationships, if the best path to a, an equitable school community is one that's built on relationships and you have energy to burn, I would argue that it's not a white supremacist way of looking at things to put that energy toward things that build relationships. I, I totally agree. I don't disagree, but I, but I think it's, you know, there's danger in that. Like there's a, there's a lot of minds on that field. Right. And, and I think that that structurally in schools where you don't have a lot of parent to parent contact and the school's not doing anything about that, it's really about building relationships with maybe your kids' friends and, yeah. and, and, yeah. and that sense of patience. And and so there's this sense of really feeling disconnected while also believing that connectedness is the way. Mm. I think what I'm hearing you say, Courtney, is work on it in the sphere that you can control and don't march into the principal's office and say, we need a meeting, but just build where you are. But I just think people have a lot of anxiety about their kids, right? A lot of people convert that anxiety about their kids into energy for action. In the context of diverse school communities, I would argue that that energy for action is well spent building relationships of any kind. Yeah, I mean, and I would argue that that if you are going to sort of leverage the political capital that you bring into a school building because your school exists in a white supremacy culture, that leveraging that to try to make changes to the way the school accommodates parent voice and empowers parents to sort of demand things from their school is worthwhile energy. I think that's a very eloquent way to put it. The other thing I will add, because this has been a big dialogue in our school community of late, is, you know, we're trying to shift from being a place where everybody feels good to a place which we are not still by a long shot, though that is a stated goal, right? But trying to move from being a place where people feel good to a place where everyone does well and making sure we hold the same standards of academic excellence for every child and rallying the energy of those relationships that we've built toward lifting all boats in that way. And it's something like, I think that if you want to be a part of one of these communities and you want to do it authentically, knowing how all kids are doing and and caring about how all kids are doing and performing, doing emotionally, socially, and academically, right, is, I think, the, the ultimate goal. Like, that's what really, truly, authentically participating in the community looks like to me. There's no daylight between my kid and somebody else's kid. You are all my kids, and I want you to do well. I want you to be well. Yeah. And I believe you can be well. Yeah, right? of course. And my voice and my role in your community is to serve all of us and not just my child. And figuring out how to do that is the long and tricky and winding and complicated road because it involves shedding all of the assumptions and the values that our white supremacist culture has loaded on top of us, right? But you can't even begin that process without relationships. That's right. right. And I know that you didn't mean it this way, but one of the things that you said was make, build relationships in any way you can. And one of the things we also know that happens in integrating schools is that the white and privileged families find each other. Right. And the work that they do is like bringing in other white and or privileged families into the yes. school. Yes. So 
Yes. I mean, build relationships with everyone in every way that you can. And particularly with people that you don't already have or are not inclined to gravitate toward, I suppose, put special attention and intentionality on that. It's not just, yeah, look really carefully at who you hang out with and who you know, and whose numbers are in your phone. Yeah. And everyone knows who the first person is that you walk up to in a room. Yeah. If your first hello is to the other white mom, that's noted. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, everybody's journey is different, but I press and urge people to form relationships with people who look different than them, seem different than them, come from different places. And that has been transformative for me. And it has, to your point, Courtney, in many cases, taken a lot more time than I expected. But, you know, being friendly and and showing up counts for a lot. So just, I just want to come back to this, this idea of patience, because I think it calls into question so much of what we believe about parenting and specifically about white and, and or privileged parenting. The things that you've said during this conversation have been really profound and moving, but also my kid is crying right now because they keep getting on the sad face. So I feel like there's something important also about stepping into these places and believing in patience and believing in building relationships. But I also think we need to, to believe in resilience. I don't want to gloss over the, the heft of walking through your kid crying, saying, uh, I'm believing in patience and relationships, <laughs> but my kid is weeping to me right now and has every day this past week. And your kid is weeping because of the behavior chart? Are you sure of that? that? That's a great question. Okay. I mean, that's what I would interrogate. I would interrogate everything. Like going back to Alice falling down the rabbit hole. I mean, I'm right now I'm like Googling this book, The Blessing of a Skin Knee. Do you guys know those books? Blessing of a Skin Knee and Blessing of a B minus? No. By Wendy Mogul interrogating what's really going on and is the behavior chart really the cause of the suffering? How big a deal is it? And why would you assume that you need a systemic fix to an individual problem? Yeah, there, there's a, the piece of like, how big a deal is it? We have this mindset that BPA is bad and so you shouldn't have your kid touch a plastic bottle anytime ever in their life because it's going to kill them, right? We have this idea that like behavioral charts are bad. And so if your kid ever has to deal with an, a behavioral chart, it will ruin them for the rest of their lives. You know, the, the scale of our worry greatly outpaces the actual danger that, that, you know, that exists. So we get super stressed about all these things that big population level studies may or may not say are good or bad for you. And we decide like we have to eliminate those entirely. Like uh, there's a study where pregnant ladies who have 16 cups of coffee a day have worse outcomes. And so we say no coffee at all for pregnant ladies, right? Like we don't, we don't do nuance well at all. Right. And also you in that moment can do more to contextualize what's going on for your kid and, and make them happy and dry their tears than getting rid of this behavior chart system. I think we we avoid a lot of the hard personal work mm. in the name of fixing broken things. It's like there's this middle strata maybe that we're operating in. It's like on a large, large scale, what we're talking about today is that our culture is really screwed up and that's <laughs> a painful truth, right? And then in the middle strata, there are all these things that's like bad, 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 bad. Attack, attack, change, fix, right? That's where we live is in that space. But then below that, it's like, eh, actually, maybe it's more of like some personal work that I need to do. Like trying to sort of like toggle back and forth between like holding yourself accountable and really reflecting on your role in the flawed culture. Those two things. If, if I had to sort of describe what I am, what I think it might be, a productive place to focus my energy. It's on the micro and the really big macro Mm -hmm. and this stuff in the middle, which is where people are telling me to look where journalists are telling me to look and where the playground is telling me to look. I think that that's, that's the murky distraction zone, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's spot on. I think that's a really great way to think about it because what is the, what is the actual root problem of the behavior chart? Because like, I think if your view is that your child's spirit is going to be crushed by 
a behavior chart at school, yes. there's probably some personal work that could certainly alleviate whatever downside there may be to the behavior chart in their life. Uh, if, if your first response is, let me go change the system, rather than let me think about how this is actually affecting my kid and how I can alleviate whatever sort of impact that's having on my kid, feels like that, mm-hmm. you know, the, the sort of personal relationship piece of yeah. it is a more useful place to put your energy. Because if you, if you can solve that piece of it personally for your own kid, then you might actually have something worthwhile to offer to your community. I think yes, but I would build on that and say, look at what your own kid is experiencing and then very quickly couple that with the experience of the child sitting next to your child and the child sitting next to that child and the child sitting that to next to that child, right? If you can right. simultaneously hold in your mind the work in your home, on your child, in your personal space, and this collective idea of how does how do I fit into this larger good, you know, then you're really you're really being critical in a good way of the culture and you're working for change. I think you you have to hold other people in your consciousness and learn to do that as a practice, as a discipline. Again, it's, it, I say practice because it's something that I constantly have to, we all do, right? It's like, but, but you, when you come to love a community, it'll become natural and you love a community because you have relationships with people in it. And then you can see how is the way that I'm struggling with this different structurally different than the way that the that the family next door is struggling with this and the kid who's sitting next to my kid is struggling with this what are what ways are these different what ways are the stakes different for us what ways are we more or less able to push back against the things that exist here and and i I, you know to bring it all sort of full circle the only way you really do that meaningfully is by building relationships and when you have those you know you may still be alice falling down the rabbit hole, but there's a beautiful light all around you. (laughs) You know, I mean, there is, that's how it feels to me. It's just this incredible awareness of the flawed perfection, really, of, of the work we have to do. I mean, no one who's listening to this podcast doesn't have something to give, right? All, we all have something to give and figuring out how to give it into service of all children is so rewarding. I mean, I I still only get glimpses of it, right? It's not like I live in some, you know, spiritual plane, but like when I see it and when I feel it, wow, that transcends any momentary pain and tears over the behavior chart or, you know, my my fifth grader came home crying last week, right? I mean, it still happens, but that's life. Hey, so I have been thinking a whole lot about this episode since we recorded it. It's um, it's kind of an all over the place conversation. Yeah, I mean, our our best intentions around outlines and planning um, <laughs> sometimes can't really rein these conversations in. But I don't know. I mean, I think that's sort of the nature of these conversations, right? They're they're yeah. all over the place. I mean, for me, that's for sure. But I was trying to kind of think about what what the bullet points are. Like, what are the takeaways? For me, one of them is like, if you have time and energy to put into your school, you have to be really clear about where, how, and sort of on what issues you're going to spend that time and energy and why. Yeah. And I think to add to that, like self-reflection question, you know, who does this energy benefit and who might it harm? Right. And I love that Kelly calls it an energy magnet, whatever the issue is, right? And then, you know, what might be better places to spend that energy? Yeah. And I mean, I think, you know, sort of fundamentally, like, do do you get involved at all? When do you get involved? You know, if you want to get involved, be intentional about where and how, but it's okay to try to not sort of fix everything from day one, you know? Okay. Maybe it's like important to not change everything (laughs) day one. Maybe that's the way. Yeah, yeah, but but to do that, like you have to both be patient, which is you know hard. that's a that's a hard one. But you also have to believe in the resilience of your kid that you, you know your kid is going to be okay while you wait to see where your energy should be right. should be focused. Right, and and I think we really need to give space to acknowledging that this is a huge ask because like sure. you were saying, patience is difficult in any situation, and then you add in parenting and education and your child's whole future and whether they're going to live in their in your basement like parenting right. plus patience plus education is a lot right yeah but i think this is what it really means to be integrating and not just desegregating 
it pushes back against so much of what we think about parenting or told to believe about parenting, yeah. right? It's like the smog of parenting. Right? This is <laughs> the Pinterest like, smog of parenting. The, oh God, that's terrifying. <laughs> yeah. This was sort of what, what Kelly was getting at these like three planes of interaction. I really like that sort of way of framing. Like yeah. there are these big macro issues that are sort of systemic and those are really important to think about and, and, and focus on. And then there's interpersonal relationships down at sort of the bottom that, that are worth putting in energy and time to. And then there's all this stuff in the middle that is maybe easier to think about. And there are a lot of people who say this is the important stuff and it's really hard, but you just have to try to leave that stuff alone and trust that your kid's going to be okay. Yeah. The parenting piece of this is really big and we're planning to talk about that in a future episode or two, but yeah, in that middle plane is the hardest to let go of because that's the plane that everyone focuses in. Yeah. Right. Like how much homework or how many field trips and what's the enrichment and you know, the biggest takeaway is really what we keep repeating in every episode that this is that integrating is all about relationships and investing in relationships above all else. Yeah. And I think also the most important first step is do no harm. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we, we will do harm anyway. But. Right. Sorry. A try to do no harm. <laughs> be mindful that you might yeah. be doing harm. Thank you, listeners, for hanging in with us. This was a long one, but please keep sending us your voice memos. Hello at integratedschools.org. Check out that video on the website. Uh, join us on Facebook, Twitter. And thanks to everyone who has emailed and rated and reviewed. We love your feedback. We appreciate it. It means a lot. And we are grateful to be in this with you all as we try to know better and do better. See you next time. 